Berkland and subsequent researchers, including Al Thane, showed that there's such a thing as a force-free filament. And that's a basic structure that nature forms at all scales. And a force-free filament is that at the outside of this filament, the currents are moving helically, and the magnetic field is exactly the same, helical, like a tight screw. At the center, if you have a helical uh, current, at the center of that current, called a solenoid, you have a magnetic field that runs straight along the axis. So the current and the field at the center runs straight along the axis. In between, it's intermediate. You get a, a tighter and tighter helix as you go from the center of this filament to the outside. So all of these things, you know, the currents combine so as to produce the magnetic fields, and the magnetic fields guide the currents. So we've explained this in one of our videos. We can post the, uh, the link. Mm. Um, so that's the easiest, the, the uh, minimum energy loss way of getting current from one place to the other. So that's because Mother Nature is not lazy, but she doesn't want to work hard. That's the way that uh, currents move in the universe and here on Earth. And before we get back to the story of, you know, the, like, the cost of experiments rising and the fact right. that Berkland had to f fund himself, how, was this transformative for the paradigm of how we understood the universe when he discovered it? Was it, or did people kind of already know that there must have been some kind of current? No, this was a big, Earth? this was a big discovery. And it would have, so this was, again, at the same time as discovery of the electron, x-rays, radioactivity, radioactive materials, nuclear energy, relativity. Um, all of these discoveries were going on at the turn of the 20th century, from the 19th century. To a certain extent, because of his location in Scandinavia and in Norway, not in the major centers, his work was lesser known. It would have become much greater known. He was being considered for the Nobel Prize. Scandinavians were aware of his work. Um, and the problem was he died. Mm. And you can't be awarded a Nobel Prize posthumously. And because he was, you know, no longer active, a lot of this knowledge was not incorporated into the main, um, the main trend of the revolutionary developments in physics. Mm. So plasma physics, almost from the start, started to become isolated from the rest of physics. Mm. Very briefly, it is a funny story. Um, he realized that his theories led to the idea of electromagnetic acceleration of a projectile. So he thought, aha, military applications. And even back then, military applications got better funding. So he um, set up a joint stock company to fund the development of an electromagnetic gun. Now, he found that the velocities weren't fast enough for artillery, so he said this would be used to launch torpedoes. So he set up a big fundraising event with a live demonstration, oh, no. <laughs> something that we never do. Uh, and he set up this demonstration, and he said, you'll see nothing, you'll hear nothing, but the target will be destroyed. So they were all sitting right next to this machine and there was a short 
So he got a tremendous arc. These arcs are very loud. We have tiny loud arcs that sound very loud. There was a huge burst of light. And as he put it, in an instant, I shot my stock price from 300 kroner to zero. So everybody was, you know, they didn't want anything to do with it. But he, as a scientist, viewed this arc and he knew, uh, uh, I may be pronouncing this wrong, Eddie, who was working on the chemical problem of artificial nitrogen fertilizer. So people were running out of bat guano, which was the, the source of nitrogen fertilizer. And he needed a tremendous spark. And Berkland said, I have a tremendous spark. I can deliberately do what I did accidentally. So together, they developed the process that to this day produced <laughs> the tons of nitrogen fertilizer that have vastly increased food production around the world. And this is still a big industry in Norway. So he used that to fund his expeditions. So you were already having the transition that you needed corporate funding, uh, your own in an industrial research lab, or funneled through the universities. Now this became much more centralized after World War II, in which, you know, the defense establishment in the United States and elsewhere looked at the atomic bomb, this transformative weapon, uh, and said, oh my God, we have to take control of research, scientific research. Scientific research is the way to control the world. So you had this tremendous centralization of scientific research funded by the federal government, fed through both the universities directly, as we now see when this process is being reversed under Trump, and through the, um, the big research labs of the industries, both self-funded and funded by government, mm. L Labs, IBM Labs, and so on. Our videos come out of LPP Fusion's research in fusion energy, which will power a future with abundance for all, with a clean, sustainable economy and environment. Goods, housing, and infrastructure would be extremely affordable once fusion kicks in. Fusion energy is the key to an advanced future. Support fusion research. The link's in the description, and thanks. Thank you.